That was good. So, <clears throat> I start with the notion of intuition. As you, I guess you all know, uh, T came from experimenting with intuition. <coughs> what Eggburn did when he was a neural neurologist at the army. Psychiatrist, okay. And maybe he was bored and he experimented whether you can guess about the professions of all these naked people who are not stuffed with the insignia of their profession and still can know a lot. And this goes back to Intuition and Ego States, the first papers in 1949, and here you can look at Paul McCormick's book, I've guessed the, these first um, articles between 1949 and 1962, and this has been also the, the origins of Ego States model and starting TA as a, a school at its own. And certainly the TA concepts Eric Byrne came up with have been illustrations of his own intuitions from the perspective of a certain profession, means psychotherapist, with it within a professional framework, within a cultural framework of that time. And interestingly enough, the first one of the first uh, figures he had have been just two circles. One circle uh, there is written in a lawyer, and a, a, a small circle behind there is a boy. So his first perspective was that behind a professional identity there is a private identity and uh, a private role back in history of a boy. Unfortunately, later on, he, he lost his uh, connection with professions, uh, only made a classical uh, personality model of it. So, and because it was psychotherapy, it was connected later with motivations, with biography, and because he thought what is reenacted here is a phenomenon of transference. The first definition of script is a transference drama. And a life, a idea about life that is emerging from that, so limiting life plans, enacting drama. But there have also been notions, and Fanita is commenting on that, and I guess you, Rosemary, do as well, that in the early writings of Byrne, he also thought about uh, life designs more neutrally, not so much uh, as a pathological pheno phenomenon, uh, as a limitation. It was always there, but he, because his profession and his background more uh, draw him to the classical uh, track Somehow he lost. Also, he almost thought, in principle, there's, there are good games, there are good life scripts. He never worked that out a lot. Concerning life plans, uh, I find my, I'm rooted in Fanita's work, Fanita English's work. She's one of my teachers and I admire her for what she did in her life and uh, how she has put her ideas over time to get announced a new book on scripts, uh, I can very much sign that as this is uh, also very much compatible or even equal with my attitudes to life design. And she's working on creative scripts and it takes a whole life from a childhood idea, what I will be, and how I live it through, and the many, many layers of creative transformances during my life course. And it, this is not 
bound to classical understanding of transference or reenacting traumatic experiences. Byrne defined intuition based on Aristotle the, the way we know something without knowing how we know and often without knowing in words at least what we know but we act as if we knew and two conclusions are coming from that I guess we will never know how we know and it's not important it's more important to learn the dialogue with what we know then and because we very often already act on an impression, on an intuition, we should take a meta stance and watch in, in what reality we start to act to understand what our intuitive understanding of reality that I'm invited to, I have. So, and this is what we do through supervision to, to understand uh, Bern said, uh, people within seconds, they have intuitive ideas about each other and start to act on these ideas and come together in, in a conjoint play. You can put that in the theater metaphor. Uh, for good and for bad. And if it's good, you are not so much interested <laughs> to be aware of it. Uh, in order to learn as an as organization, you should be interested. So to learn from these processes how, how you can work together in a good way. Also, you do not know everything how you do it. But you learn to make that happen more often and learn to do it, make that happen in a controlled way. So we act as if we knew if we want to have a hypothesis what we th what we might have known then we have to guess or study what we are already acting on and i thought about i will not uh, give you all the ideas of eric burn what is around intuition you can read that in this book, but some the basic things I think that should be mentioned, and some of the things I developed further. So, the function of intuition for me is to compre compress ideas on many logical levels of reality. Also, you do not have a computing of how the logics go with each other. They are just torn together to action. And this is ne necessary if, for example, an ancient human is drinking at a spring, is confronted with a wolf. So there are many, many analytical questions, but no time to answer. Because <laughs> it's going direct into action, what you intuitively put together. This means that one of the uh, unquestioned qualities of intuition is that you deal with complexity and that makes you very fast. But if you are not informed, for example, that uh, you have not experience on uh, which, which trees are easily to be climbed on or not, or if there is sand in between, and you are, do not know that this kind of sand, when it looks like this, it's, it's not far, but it's very loose sand, so you will take long to get to this tree. So, uh, you can be very fast in making a decision, but you can make the wrong decision because you are uninformed. So this questions the idea that intuition is a natural thing. It isn't. It has to do with knowledge. It has to do with competence. 
and you, your intuitions can be as better the more experience about life you have. And this is also true for intuition in professional roles. <coughs> and there are some myths about intuition. For example, intuition is selfish. Byrne introduced that idea, uh, asking the question, uh, what have you to do that you are ready to offer your competence in intuition for the purposes your client is seeking and not for your own purposes, how you can use the client for your needs. And this means if you are not on, under cultural control, you would just exploit the other person. And he had the nice notions of uh, uh, how people are interested in each other. The basic interest in each other is cannibalism. 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 Oh, wow. This sounds strange, but if you put it in a symbol way, symbolic way, uh, from the viewpoint of Jung's psychology, it's wonderful. This means I want to eat you up, so I want the essence of you be essence of mine. And this is why I try to bite something from you, take it, <laughs> make it into pieces that I can take it into myself, digesting, let go <laughs> what I cannot need and make mine uh, what I can use. So. Cannibalism is wonderful. Why should we not be interested in? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, which book? Yeah, that's exactly the question I wanted to ask. I a may, it's the one, it's the first or the second uh, article in the in the Intuition Ego State book. It's the forty nine or the fifty one. And this is a, a, a ba certainly he's referring that to psychoanalytical development phase. Faces and the second interest in the other person is how um, this is oral cannibalism. The second one is how how can I uh, have power over you? How can I influence you? Because it's a basic need to have the experience with each other that I can do something, and I need uh, to have a um, impact. And he's tying this into the uh, a anal phase. So the interest is uh, learn, uh, in relationships. I want somehow have the experience of having impact, having power. And there's nothing bad about it, as long as it is conscious. And as long as it's done in a way that also serves the client, certainly we do want to have impact. And if it's appropriate to the roles, the stages, the place we are in, that we do not try to have a kind of power that uh, um, is fitting to our other, other reality. So, and the third is exhibitionism and voyeurism. And if you hear these words, you think, oh, <laughs> should, should we deal with each other in this dimension? Yes. I give a lecture. <laughs> see, see the essence, the not geist essence of who I am. I want to impress you uh, with what I can show you from me. That's the essence of exhibitionism. And you cannot be a, a good teacher if you... Uh, do not have a tendency to be an exhibitionist, but certainly you should keep your clothes shut <laughs> and do it do it on a more uncultured level. <laughs> but it's okay, and and you should be wireless. You should be interested. It should be give you some comfort to watch me, to show you my intimate parts of what I, what I am. Why? So that's. If you don't leave it on the primitive sexual uh, stage, 
Zen is a wonderful description of what is necessary that people have satisfaction with each other. And Burns said, uh, you should be aware of these interests in each other and find good ways to enact it. Otherwise, your intuition, if you don't take care of that, your intuition uh, will be busy with, besides the official contract, getting on a non-appropriate level some satisfaction around this. So the, the part of the interview about sexuality will be half an hour longer than you need it to have any diagnosis to do something, because you are uh, you're doing a bit sexual exploitation. So it's better you learn to have an understanding how erot erotic it can be to give good supervision without knowing intimate details about sexual life. What is over time? Bo boring anyway. There are not so many variations that you could be interested in that all your lifetime. <laughs> But Bern had the idea, intuition is to make you safe, to give you satisfaction. Uh, and that is an assumption that is valid. But on the same time, I think uh, there is a, a basic need of cooperation. And it's not a basic idea of exploitation. Modern science says evolution is cooperation. But if you follow Burns' idea, then it's a good focus to say, what do I need uh, uh, to use my way of creating reality, also by intuition, at the same time be something that helps you, and not only, uh, and not helps me beside uh, that is helping you too much. It's a question of balance as well. And there's also the question, should you be neutral? Is it, is it, are you better with your intuition when you withdraw? And psychoanalysis try to do that by not being in the picture when they are talking to each other. The Rogerian therapy thought they can find a position where you just reflect what is, that's a, as an illusion. You cannot but telling your own story uh, while you are working with somebody. But you should <coughs> learn to tell your own story in a way that the other person at the same time can further develop her or his own story. So it's always a conjoined story. If you uh, give yourself not permission to tell your own story while working, it even if it, you would manage to do so, your soul would not be much interested in that. Why should they? So I used um, the concepts and some definitions to open up broader perspectives on intuition. So I'm saying it's not a knowledge. This, I'm saying it's a judgment. It's a decision on how reality might be. And intuition can be qualified or unqualified. I started this with the example of the wolf. If you do not have the knowledge that if the sand looks like this, you will be not very fast, it's unqualified intuition. It's fast, but it's not helpful. And the more intuition is directed to processes that are not part of your uh, in culture so far, your private culture or so, you have to learn new intuitions, new, new judgments about reality uh, from the perspective of your roles directed to specific worlds, organizational worlds. 
So you have to learn to focus intuition according to the sphere that is relevant right now and not have habitual intuitions. You certainly always can have an intuition what may be background, childhood scenes behind the behavior of a person in the here and now. And they may pop up and are interesting and plausible, but they are habitual. You have to step back a bit and find out are these intuitions important for what, for the roles and the kind of encounter we have now and for what, to what our encounter should lead. Oh, I need other judgments about reality to understand this. Organizational structures in the background, economical relationships, and so on. And I integrate this knowledge through training, through supervision. And so, the more often I do it, the more it, it's sinking down to my professional intuition. Certainly intuition should be trained and can be trained. And I learn on a meta level, not to, not to activate intuitions that are not appropriate when we are in a leadership situation, for example. So my organism also learns intuitive self-regulation to come up with the right intuitions and not with intuitions. Uh, I have to think about, is that okay for what we do now? So it's a way of being incultured uh, in a certainly intuitive way. And this certainly also means that intu uh, intuition is not something to be freed or something should be uh, located in a child ego state. Your child is not, the child is not the part from which you activate, for example, intuition as a broker. Why, why, why should, why should this be in a child ego state? Doesn't make sense to me. But your intuition is an actor. Pardon? In your theatre model, your intuition is an actor. Yes. No child? <laughs> I never put the question like this. If you want to deal with the notion of intuition as an actor, what does it make a difference if you use the ego state model to try to describe that? So, circles are not cupboards uh, or case or yeah, cases. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And certainly different. Professionals should have different masteries in the intuition. This means different competences uh, to judge reality and different systems to organize their, co their images about reality because they have different responsibilities. And if you want to be potent and quick as a professional, you do it intuitively and your conscious mind is doing the supervision. But you do it from because it's quick and powerful from your trained professional intuition. Berm uh, related to intuition uh, to as an art of knowing something that has been there or is there somewhere. It's actual. And the Jungian psychology talks about intuition as, as the soul is somehow able to have an idea what would be there and could be there. And this is, a, this, this function of the soul is different than theoretic, uh, uh, adopting theoretical ideas what could be there. No, of all the things that could be there, your soul somehow may anticipate, uh, what what could be realized, but it still needs help to become real. That's a, you know, so, so to understand this function of the soul, we should have to go more into the union stuff. What we can do right now? There is now. potential for it. Yes, <laughs> it is to be uh, realized. Yes, right. Yes, right. So um, when.
Burns suggested it was represented archaic reality. What did he mean? He's relating to uh, actual real in uh, in the past actualized reality. That's a different notion than potential reality. It's n yeah, you you. What is potential cannot be uh, kept uh, uh, preserved by your senses. It's mm. it's another function. We do not know what it is. Mm. And yet, I mean, I assume that Bern read you. I don't know. We don't know about you, but one would have thought he would have done, given his reading so much. Maybe not relating to the intuition stuff. <laughs> Uh, maybe he wrote you read Jung around myth, uh, um, Greek tragedies and and symbols. I don't know. It's surprising given Burns interest in intuition. Yeah. yeah, but as far as I've read, he never uh, pointed to the intuition of the possible. But. I believe uh, that if you want to become important to a client or to an organization, this has a lot to do with whether you can come up with images where, where we, you could go with them, how they could be one time. And everybody is very much interested about um, reflections and mirroring of what could I be. And if you give somebody an idea on that, just fantasize it. If it has really to do with what are, is in the range of the options for this person, even if the person never thought about becoming that person, you fantasize, you have an immediately reaction say, oh, this person is important for me because he can see something in me, what I immediately know that I should be, I can be, what what I didn't discover myself. And that's very important uh, for uh, uh, bounding, for bounding, or for bonding. bonding, for bonding in a relationship. And And if you listen to people, they are always somehow busy to become somebody. If you listen to somebody from the perspective, what is this person trying to tell you what he is going to become? Uh, it's interesting how you interpret what the person is saying. And we are always busy to want to become somebody. We always want, are busy to further our life story in, some, in the one or the other way. And if my soul recognizes the other person as somebody who is sensitive to uh, fitting options for me, then I'm certainly interested in cooperation. <coughs> this is a Jungian model I just wanted to show the slide. Um, it's saying there are four independent approaches to reality that have go uh, uh, cooperate to have a whole picture of reality. And this is uh, the classical experiencing what comes into your senses. That's the, the ability uh, to realize what's already there. And the other part of the world is the potential world, not the actual world. Well, this is intuition of the possible. And the other thing is, you are, can think. I don't know whether think is the right word, but you can put it in a, in an order, in a logical order. This is about content. Or you have a, f a sense of, is it valuable? Is it essential? <clears throat> this is a question of essence, not of content. And sometimes, uh, if, if you're a specialist for content, you have to have a lot of analyzing until you understand what you could do. If you are 
volume function is working well, then you have very quickly an idea which of the possible routes lead to something essential and which do not. And the Jungian idea is that you have in the first half of your life you have two functions. Uh, all functions have to be trained. You have two functions. You are quite good in that. But if you grow old, the maturity is not seen to getting more and more perfect in your best functions, but integrates the other functions as 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 complementary and as control. So the mature person is not the perfect person, but the whole, the person with a holistic approach to reality. And he also says that the psychological theory, if if you keep your uh, not so easy activa being activated function in the shadow, then they will undermine your whole capacity of, of judging. For example, my brother, he's a phys he has been an engineer, promo, Dr. Inch, and working in, um, uh, in, in, in atom physics. And I thought, I'm a realist. I can uh, relate to everything very scientifically. When I watch him, he's, he's totally controlled by values and judgments he never reflects because he, he cannot uh, think about them with his thinking function. Or uh, if you say, I'm a person who is always uh, going along with my feelings, what feels right to me, uh, if the person does this too long, the person gets a victim of miserable thinking. So in the Jungian perspective, if you want to be mature, uh, it's no way not to train all four functions and learn to integrate them. That's a holistic understanding. And I think that's also, and this is also true for intuition. So intuition is judgment of reality. So all four functions are certainly also important for intuition. What is limiting in intuition? Burns said basically two things. One is taboos. And he was very much in the ego state model when he thought about this. And this shows also how his thinking uh, well, was limited by the ego state model. There are two taboos. This means uh, your parent does not allow you to see these aspects of reality. So it's limiting your understanding and judging reality. And be, if you are intuitively competent, you need to detect a taboos and open them up. That's the one limitation. The other limitation are desires and fears. He located it in the child. So Your intuition then is seduced or blocked or driven by hidden motivations, which we do not dare to face or to admit. And that's uh, thinking we uh, can agree easily. Huh? So we should be aware of what our desires, what our fears are, uh, and work them through or confront, be confronted with them. But these are only two limitations, I've uh, discovered at least three or four more. One are uh, fixations and habits, again. So but who detected the other ones? Because you said you found yeah, one. Yeah, I came up with this, with this following now, the so more, more limitations. The, the, before, the, the, the two are burn. Ah, the two are burn. Yeah, ah. taboos and ah, okay. desires and fears. Okay. It's in, in, the, in the articles in this book, Intuition and Ego State. Mm -hmm. And somehow Bern didn't uh, relate to that. I believe that most of the limitations of creative intuition have to do with, with habitual understanding of reality. 
we talked about this more many times these days. And also, intuition is limited by the lack of competence and knowledge. What I try to illustrate you with not knowing that this kind of sand is not easy to go through. So certainly, you cannot be a good intuitive professional if you do not have enough competence and knowledge in your field. And there is another limitation I call blocking experimental flow. Uh, this means an attitude uh, that you dare just to start somewhere, not knowing, and being confident that while you are moving forward, intuitions come and you can, in the learning conversations, do something with these intuitions. If you do not feel allowed to do that, then it's a blocking of the intuitive process. And another limitation, I don't know whether really it's a separate one, but uh, I described it as lack of tuning into each other's spirit. So, um, if you are habitually trained to understand all reality from your point of view, and you are not trained to sit beside the other person and explore their frame of reference and the spirit that is in it. It's not only <coughs> an, an analytical thing, <coughs> but you get a feeling of what is important with this person. And if you are not invited to and not trained to, to learn to tune into that, then you are limited in your intuitions. And very often that's the case, a lack of inspiring ideas. Many, as I already mentioned, mentioned, many managers think because they are managers, they certainly have ideas. And they have problems in admitting that, that they do not have an idea. There are no creative designs that come to their mind. And so they do, they just repeat what they know. And, uh, certainly would help them to use their intuition <coughs> when they invite others who have ideas and inspirations and accept that it has to go together with their competencies. And maybe they are good administrators, why not? Altogether, uh, Bern came to the conclusion that scientific methods which offer more security and intuition, which open up, opens up more options, are the mutual basis for creative action. So creativity is the combination of both, the, and it has to do with education on both levels. So you're saying we need both, well, quoting you, Burn, that we need both. Yes. The mutual basis for creating. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. often, like I'm, you can think of. Um, that the people that would be really opposed to that. Mm. They're really? Well, I'm, you can think of a few people that I know would be opposed, would not agree with that. Okay. But they, I mean, they're not, don't believe in intuition because they don't see it as being scientific enough to prove. Yeah, yeah because they have a, a narrow understanding of what intuition is. When they listen to a lecture like this, they begin to see, oh, that's not magic. And we, if they meet people who are, say stupid things and saying this is intuition, mm -hmm. certainly they do not like it. Mm -hmm. And just things like Einstein's dreams mm. absolutely affecting his scientific yeah. thinking mm. is often for the people with a scientific paradigm right. really helpful to see yeah. the possibility. There's been a book fairly recently as well by a whole lot of scientists about the role of intuition in the world. Yes. 
And if you hear the repass on the uh, Han and uh, Teller and the early people who did the, the atom bomb, then uh, they always had conversations uh, in which they dealt with intuitions and dreams and ideas. Because uh, that's a function that helps you to, to tie together things that are uh, on very, in very different fields in the actual order of, of science. And you often have to pull them totally together anew without having a logic for pulling them together. And this is why you need intuition for that. They've done published work, haven't they, recently on decision making, how decisions are made, mm -hmm. and discovered that we think we've, we're deciding cognitively because we learn and this is the process, but actually we've already made the decision. Yeah. Before we yeah. got to the process, of yeah. they're doing with them um, scanning, brain scanning to show yeah. that this is happening. So, if in neuroscience terms, there, you know, what is this thing that is happening before we're making the decision we think we're making? Mm -hmm. and I would see this fitting mm -hmm. somewhere. But I also think that most people don't really understand what science is either. Really? So, yeah, yeah. for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's hard to talk about something scientifically that is... I think we've kind of fused science with technology yeah. now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the mid-20th century being so technology-focused. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of ways of thinking. Um, um, to also responding, um, we seem to be aligned with a lot of... Um, which yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 can I go on with background images? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking a bit at the time and the, the overall plan we have. <clears throat> so, we have already talked about this uh, model and I hope you, you recognize it in several parts of how we discuss. This is a, a, a basic model of how we understand that people are functioning. Though, let me look at life plans for a moment. I already said that Fanita's view is my view as well. So, life plans are influenced by the nature of an individual, and we do not know what nature is, because we know now that uh, development and shaping of the brain starts from the first day in the uterus. So you never know what what have been uh, the genes and what is education of some kind. It's also in the beginning it's on a chemical niveau, but it's it's limiting of all possible realities. It's limiting the variations that are right for you because you have an history. But some of it's not important whether it's nature or whether it's education. It's just there. And life plans are also influenced, what Fanita points out as well, uh, by talents and ambitions. Some problems you only get because you are talented or because you have ambitions. If you would not be so talented and not have so much ambitions, there is no tension coming into your life with which you have to fight. And fighting a life design that somehow can deal with that tension. And it's also equipments and requests from family. Yes, and here's all the classical ideas of script formation in the positive and the negative way can't come in, but only as a part of the many influences. And if you are supposed to be a follower, in, uh, for example, in a business, 
as in many cultural traditions, is just normal. The first boy has to be a craftsman of this or that kind as well. This is not scripting in a negative way. That's, these are just expectations. And they are not not only superficial expectations, uh, as you would um, describe them by parent directions. It's just something that is, is, is culturally natural. You inhale that when you are young, because that's the way things are. And it can give you your life a direct direction. Nobody knows whether your own direction would be better. Maybe you should accept it, but find your own way to do it. And life plans are come, uh, have to realize attitudes to life and lifestyles of the milieu you are coming from. The cultural milieu, the, the part of the society or what else. So, for me it's always important to understand the milieus of origin of a person, to understand shop. Because somehow people are bound and obliged to these milieus. They want somehow to be a member or bringing further what is a tradition in their milieu. And formative experience often represented as key events or inner images. I'm listing this not uh, um, not to analyze all these things. I'm just saying it's a multitude of ingredients that you have to deal with when you try to form a life design, a life plan. And we do not know how much we know about. And still we have to do something. And so we we have... <coughs> We don't have to find out how it is constructed. We just have, we can, like the mosaic or the image gallery, find many <laughs> pictures that together tell a story uh, how I try to make my life plan. It's, an, it's a narrative method to understand life plan. And Fanity English, also in this article, very early, uh, tried to describe how a person, what are the basic patterns of a life design and what are transformations from uh, different significant ages which he took from developmental psychology before school, in school, at the last, uh, puberty, adolescence and so on. In, in the first version she had four phases. I remember the only three. Now I, I've read there are five or six. You can choose it as you want. The basic idea is but from adopted stories understand what the tendencies of the soul are uh, bec uh, and that's why the soul has adopted these stories and not others. So I thought I, I ta had a long conversation with her which, which is published in German uh, in the 80s and I asked her, how, what do you think how TA would have been developed if Bern wouldn't have died so early? And she said, probably in the direction of Jungian psychology. Why did she think that? I don't know. Probably because she, she didn't like the mechanical and the ideological <coughs> developments in TA. And he was quite on the Fun? Ben talked about Jung quite a bit, didn't he? Like, yes, yeah. and, and because of his interest in Greek mythology. Yeah, mm. mostly because of his interest in Greek mythology. Yes. 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 So, I'm looking at life plans from the perspective that humans are narrative beings. So, life is myth, it's telling you a story. And as far as I can see, that's a really well a difference between animal and humans. We are often said making tools or so is a difference. The more we understand what animals do, it's not the difference. 
telling telling stories to make a story out of your life. I don't know whether monkeys do that, or dolphins, or elephants, or uh, grass. These are animals the, the most intelligent because they recognize their own picture in a mirror. Dolphins do. I know. Yeah, dolphins do. Uh, mon uh, monkeys. Apes. Uh, um, um, Gra uh, grass, 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 grass. Parrots. Uh, what's the name? Parrots. Yeah. Papagali. No, 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 not papagai. The blackbirds. Crows. Crows. They do. Parrots. Some. Some. Maybe per some parrots do as well. Yeah. Elephants do. So that's one of the. Time. It's not different. We don't know whether they have an idea about the myths they want to develop in their life. <coughs> as far as up to now, I think only humans are doing that. And that's what, in the end, is the most interesting thing from th to, uh, to them. So, this is why people are always oriented to what they want to become, how to transform the story of their life. And the Jungian psychology always directed to what um, it's a final perspective, not an original perspective. If somebody is in a disorder, from the Jungian perspective, I look, how is this uh, immature version of what this person could be one time, instead of how is this uh, a consequence of a bad history? And says a different way to view on things. And as I said before to you, if you listen from this perspective, it's interesting that within on a party within three five minutes, a person gives you some hints how the person actually tries to transform the story of her life adding something, getting a new role, a new stage, a new story, and you can use theater metaphor in order to describe that. So, it's important to have the empathy for the possible and a partner in figuring out, and for that you need the intuition for the possible future of the other. So, for what can we use images? My 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 theory is uh, I don't know whether others have that too. I, I came to it for myself, but may, very often after I'm finished, I find out that it's written in the literature since <laughs> hundreds of years, but I didn't read it. I said uh, our soul is just storing images. You have millions of impressions and images during your life. How come that you store the ones and you forget millions of the others? And my idea is because the ones somehow are mirroring your uniqueness, your character. For example, from all the discussions around the world, uh, around the Vietnam War, the only image I remember is that in the newspapers, in one sentence was written that Ho Chi Minh always fixed his jacket when it was torn himself. How? What does this tell about me that that's, I found it worth to keep that and I didn't do that purposely. I, somehow I picked it up. So if you go through your life and gather all the things you have picked up and kept positively or negatively, but they impressed you, they mirrored something, then you have many images that together can tell you more about your uniqueness than many anal anal analyses. And this is why it's so worthful to work with images. And you can, can do this again in a focused way, as we did in these two uh, guided imagery. I asked for images, but focused it very well. 
you can do the same work with focusing on sexual style or in how to grow old or whatever. And I started to make a method out of it when I was a student counselor 35 years ago or so. And I had some students I could easily work with by showing them how to do technical battles at work or things like that. But there have been some students I felt like it's like a puppet where the strings are cut. It's the meaning of all that got lost and it doesn't make sense to work with them on a technical level. So we, somehow we should find out what was the soul had image, what could be the result of a life development and of specifically of a university career. And this was 1976 after I've uh, been with Bill Holloway and had done my first guided imagery and first ideas how you could work with something like that. I, I experimented and I had four or five people together for one day and I asked them, imagine you have been young, what did you want to become one day? And especially the young man said, oh, train conductor. And we had four train conductors. And I was not sure whether this is a very good analytical question. But you only have to ask one question more. What did you image what life is about? What is a typical scene in the life of a train conductor? And then the one says, me and my engine. Nobody knows it as I do. He also says, my colleague and I, two comrades are traveling around the world. The third says, so many people who trust me, I shall guarantee for a safe trip. The fourth one said, Oriental Express. Many foreign countries, great uniform. I personally welcome all VIPs. This was a Romanistic student in about the twenties term. And I had an interview with him and he said he hates his university career, but he loves his job he, with, with with which he is earning his money. Mm-hmm. Guess he what? what? He loved his job. Ah, his job. Guess what? <laughs> Portier at the Grand Hotel. Ah. <laughs> Portier. Create oh, okay. great uniform, personally welcome all VIPs. <laughs> <laughs> he found, he found, he found the ingredients of what he dreamt of being one day, a professional one day in that job. The only problem was, uh, it doesn't fit his, uh, educational level <laughs> and the money was not. So, if you want to catch his interest, in a professional life, you have to check whether studying Romanistic can somehow lead to situations like this. And this changes the perspective on, prof- on profession, on professions. We learn so much to look on professions just by the competencies, not by the typical life situation in which professional life happens. And there are a lot of criteria quality criteria, what make, satisfies the soul in professional life that people very often are not aware of. They intuitively certainly look for better ones than uh, uh, bad ones, but they do not, it's, it's not, a, um, it's not a, a, a level for conversation or prof- professional check, and it should be. So, for example, well, I had a professor who lost sense in in doing being a professor, and he didn't understand why. And I made an interview like this with him, and in all pictures there have been two friends working together. I said, "Oh yeah, I always had one, and the last one died two years ago, and nobody followed." So, and he had a total different perspective on why he lost meaning in his job. And then you, uh, certainly this method doesn't tell you what to do then, but he, now he knows what the criterion is. Maybe he could invite more, 
that oh, they are too young, it's not the same, okay. In your private life, maybe you can satisfy that need more on stages in your private life and you're satisfied and you do not miss it so much in your organization life or whatever. But uh, talking about these images helps him to understand. And these images usually are not hidden. There's no, it's only not asked for. It's not, it's not hidden. There's no resistance. I just invite the dialogue on that and they pop up. And certainly you can use that to understand, uh, for organizational development, uh, which organizational roles are appropriate to somebody. For example, the one who is saying, He's a good train conductor, but meaning is coming from my colleague and I, two comrades. If you can give him the best train, it's not interesting for him. But the other one, my engine and me, he would be interested. He might become a problem if he has the best machine, but the machine has electronics he do not understand. So the part of nobody knows it, as I do, gets lost through technical development. This model is not saying what you can do then, but you have different categories to think about. If, if then the person wants to move, what can he do? So if, uh, a machine, an electronic machine, isn't it? Maybe he has to change your field where his sense for mechanical working uh, still can be satisfied and has to leave a technology where this is, cannot be gained. Or he can develop in a way of, I do not know how it's technically working, but still I'm a special on un understanding which programs and so to work out. You can find out whether you can, um, whether he can find this quality in life in a different way. In a, on a different level. So this, uh, the working with the images helps you to find quality criteria. And then you can think, and what have, do we have to change or where can we find that? Stages, roles, stories, and so this on. It's so much richer way of asking about people's motivation and how mm -hmm. they fit within mm -hmm. the structure they're being asked to fit in. Mm -hmm. With McClellan's idea, David McClellan, mm -hmm. motivated. This is, you get much more interesting answers, don't you? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, people adopt filters, images from their life or from stories which represent experiences, self perception, or tendencies of the soul. By exploring those images and mirroring in dialogues, as you did with us, as we get a sense of the personality and the myths and the lifestyles the soul is interested in and of ingredients of life situations which might, which might fit. So why is it important to introduce the notion of images in for professions and organizations, I said it already, for understanding and creating minimal, meaningful professional situations and one's professional career, and for understanding one's perception of organizational development. So we had to exercise on matching. And a way to easily monitoring matching and dialogue on matching. We did that exercise already. These are the six frames. So while working with background images, humans are meaning oriented and mystical, and it touches the essence of people without intimate informations. And it reveals background drifts 
in process and in relationships usually are not attended to. And it's just very effective in connecting, as you said, on many levels. And uh, it gives permission to relate to these spheres in a professional world, because we, in many cultures you think you sh this is not something that should be included. So it's important to make it natural to include spheres like this. So I, I think we should... It would be too much when we would go now into dreams and guided imagery. I just wanted to finish up. I did some uh, interesting experiments with uh, with audiences. Um, uh, I just did an an interview on people on the background images. And I introduced to the audience the person only by the background image. Right. And they have to decide which kind of company, which kind of <coughs> job, which kind of organizational role w would fit to a person with this personality. Mm -hmm. And most, they mostly, after 10 minutes, felt as if they have an idea what could fit. And if I... I've given them these description of persons and these descriptions of images, and they have to to put it to each other. Uh, they immediately had a feeling of, oh, if this is a job in the company of a person like this, it's a problem. If it's like this, somehow it feels right. It makes sense. So you can use uh, feedbacks of that kind in, in many ways. So now this was a. Now we did a long thing, but we are through it. <laughs> it might invite you into being focused on dreaming, and the one or the other might bring a dream tomorrow morning. Yes. Then we could do a learning conversations on dreams and talk about my style on working with dreams.